All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with Chuck Kurtz, and we are going to present uh, top challenges of cost estimating teams. And with the idea of empowering subject matter experts or functional estimators with best practices and data. <clears throat> so, Prodstream, who are we? We've been around for a little while now, 10 plus years. We have 50 plus years of combined industry experience. Uh, the, the core of our company is helping our customers achieve what they want to, right? Greater growth and efficiency and how do, how do they just take process and make it their own and enabled in the software is our goal. Um, so we can't help wait to help you do the same. There, there's just a sample of some of our customers here. And this is not intended to be a, a software demonstration by any means. Primarily, we're going to be looking at best practices, but I did want to give you a very brief overview of what we provide from a software standpoint. We, our, our company, we look at ourselves as both a uh, software provider, but also, you know, core. The, the software is just a means to an end, right? And that's why we're focusing on best practices today and some of the challenges that meet the industry. But primarily, we are a software-based company where we have a core cost estimating application. That's BOE Max. Max team is the project execution where you can track earned value, import actual costs. And we'll be talking about that a little bit today, uh, as well as represent some of the analytical data from the Max board perspective. Uh, a key... Um, growth area that we've had and, and a lot of attraction is the workbench application where um, the subject matter experts or the functional estimators can go into a web application and enter their data, whether it be looking up historical actuals and reusing that data or just putting in subject matter expert, you know, best judgment and also writing their rationale directly in the web application, feeding the core application database uh, has been a big hit. So that's I wanted to give you an overview of what we offer from a project suite standpoint. And for the agenda today, we'll be talking approximately 45 minutes. So at approximately 1245 or so, we'll cut and go to a, a Q and A session. So the idea here is I think Megan, we have the opportunity for folks to send in their questions via chat, and then we'll field those questions in that Q and A period of, of time. So certainly stay for the Q&A session at the end. It'll be more interactive and we'll field a lot of your questions. <laughs> so our speakers today, I have with me Chuck Kurtz, who is the Director of Pricing at BEA Systems. Thank you, Chuck, for joining us. And uh, Chuck will be speaking here in just a moment. Chuck is going to handle um, the industry challenges uh, not just from a BAE perspective, but what, what his experience has been in talking to other folks in the OEM. I, I know Chuck is part of the OEM COG, so very excited to have him here today um, and, and provide his perspective from the industry side. Thanks, Tom. My name is Tom Shanahan. I am the president and CEO of ProdStream. So my whole life for the past 15, 20 years has been um, how do we make processes more efficient? How do we make them more scalable so that the not everyday estimator right because that's primarily one of the major pains is how do they do their business better because their primary day job is engineering or drafting or software development what have you so how do we do better at that so that's been my focus for quite a while <clears throat> So really quick, I'm not going to get into too much detail here because the in our slides, we're going to get into this detail. But here's the top challenges we want to address are scattered historical records. In essence, I can't find my data. Um, we don't have a whole lot of standardization on our work products. In other words, we're, we make these donuts all the time, but we have to go revisit how we did that in, in many or a lot of cases. Uh, I also have variations in assumptions by functional estimators and, you know, with no guidance or uh, way of doing things, you're going to get a lot of different assumptions from those functional estimators if you don't provide any guidance. So we'll be talking about that. Tracking change is difficult and takes too long. So oftentimes, you know, if you're using Excel and trying to trace data that way without a 
a process to capture that and you're relying on humans to do that for you, it becomes a little challenging. And then lastly, we'll be talking about um, mystifying estimate rationale. So if you ask 50 engineers to rationalize something in, in their estimate, you're gonna get not only 50 different answers, but 50 different approaches or level of detail to that, to that rationale. And then the best practices that we'll address accordingly are, and this, this matches up with the order of detail that we discussed, is making that data accessible, but not only accessible, but also reusable. Um, for our core work product, how do we provide a reusable, repeatable base of estimate or, or core attributes to that BOE so that functional estimator can do his job better especially when it's not his daily function. Um, how do we standardize on the BOE attributes and establish feedback loops for the subject matter experts so that they're not primarily relying on engineering judgment, right? Um, what are some ways that we can provide not just change tracking, but a, a little bit more of a technological way to track those changes? And lastly, how do we train our, not only our cost engineers and folks that do this every day, but how do we translate that into making our functional estimators more um, amenable to that, that situation and provide them with better tools and better historical knowledge so that we, we can um, get past that tribal knowledge piece and just relying on, on the functional engineer's best guess. So with that, I think we get into our first slide. And so this is you, Chuck. We're going to be kind of trading off back and forth between the, the um, challenges and the best practices. So Chuck, yep. uh, you're, on, you're on the hot seat. All right. Thanks, Tom. So one of the problems that, that we currently have and, and I've experienced throughout the industry is uh, proposals have been stored in a variety of shared areas that have limited access. So you might be just working off of a, a shared folder, but if you're not given access to that folder, you don't know what data is out there that you might be able to use. It makes it difficult to harvest data from prior efforts, reuse the data. Um, additionally, we, we have to, uh, in our process here, we have to map uh, product structures to bill of materials in one system. And then you gotta look up the part numbers and task codes in a different system to get the actual hours that might be required to make a, a part. And, and, and all that requires a manual effort to align the history to proposal requirements. Uh, running, running the data from history is a quick process, but the mapping is the uh, element that takes the most amount of time uh, that, that we've experienced. Uh, defining a historical data set or a program should be completed at the proposal kickoff. And we had an example of an engineer uh, used a similar two from a laser program. So think of the technology involved with that and applied that part to some type of toad submersible. And he applied a complexity factor of 0.05%. So I had to ask, you know, is that really that similar? And, and, and no, uh, so we had to recraft the BOE and use more relevant data. Uh, and this was a case of an estimator not knowing the product he was bidding, but he knew the laser program that he had previously worked on and used that history. So not being able to access that type of data is a, is a real struggle for us. Tom? So just a question, Chuck, what, what would be like a typical day in the life of a functional estimator when, when they come into the company and they get tagged for going to do an estimate? So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so one of the things we have to do is we have to get them trained and, and they have to go through some mandatory training before they can write a BOE. Uh, we, you know, we have to demonstrate that they're trained. Even though they may have been trained somewhere else, we still have to go through our internal trainings. And then they have to go off and learn where all, these, all this data resides. Uh, we have uh, financial data that's in one area. We have uh, operations, manufacturing data in another, and engineering has their their data bank. So it, it it's a it's kind of a kind of a hard process for one person to go unravel that maze of data. So are they oftentimes relying on um, knowledge of more senior engineers to go 
walk through that process? Yeah. So you got to go back to this maze and, and, and the other folks. And, and a lot of times it ends up being, oh, you got to go talk to John and, and, and John will tell you where this data is. And, and that's, I think the term is tribal knowledge uh, that we use. And that kind of sets the pace of hard to repeat that type of information. Um, when, when John's gone, where's that data reside? So ideally, um, the idea would be to transcend that. And when John leaves, there's there's documentation and transferable knowledge that they can more easily access, right? And that's that's sometimes a difficult jump. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the uh, struggles I think that every company is uh, dealing with today and trying to develop the the data um, knowledge transfer, I think is the way we could refer to it for the future uh, generations to, to be able to pull that information. And we got smart people, they'll figure it out, but sometimes it, if you give them the right tools that they can do it that much quicker. Right. So let's move into the best practice. Um, so the best practice would be, obviously we've been talking about scattered data everywhere and having to go through a process, there's a little bit of tribal knowledge, but if we can get to a point where we can have a centralized database with all your historicals in it and go through a process that's that's documented so that when engineers come in and get more senior and don't have to do BOEs anymore and a new guy comes in, that they're able to go and find all that data a little bit more easily, but even better than that, have a process to go along with that and, and find that data more easily. Um, so, you, you know, you're gonna have co more confidence, cost realism in your project estimates because you can leverage that historical data much more easily. <clears throat> so that's that's really the core is um, that, that data probably exists somewhere, but going to find it, especially which, you know, some of the challenges, the timeliness of, of getting the data and getting the proposal out, right? is you're really relying on somebody's knowledge to go sift through this where, you know, if you're able to speed that up, you're gonna have much higher quality when the pens go down at that point. And you're gonna be able to rely on more primary data from, you know, whether it be your subcontractors or internally in-house as opposed to provided secondary data. <clears throat> um, so here, here is a pictorial, right, of how this might be done. So the screenshot here is showing a query of your entire set of data, potentially, right, where your actuals come into the system via a task level or work breakdown structure or a combination thereof. But the key is to be able to not only find it, so here you can see the ability to go search on a particular project or task or even documentation, who is the resource, even you can search on parts. That whole thing allows me to not have to go sift through data and files and folders and just find exactly what I'm querying and be able to pull in composite data, not just a task where I can pull in potentially many tasks or WBS subsets, what have you. And then I can also, the key is once I found it, I can reuse it, right, by leveraging a complexity factor, um, allowing that information in. You can see other attributes of if if a SME or a functional estimator had put in rationale, I, I have that all in documentation, right? So it's not just the estimate data, it's performance data, the program data. All that data can be carried forward as, as part of the attributes of the BOE. And then the key factor here is once I have what I want, I can um, leverage that and pull in from my historical data. In other words, I can copy and paste that right in or not even copy and paste, right? I'm writing it right in and I'm defining, you know, what is the area of the project that I want this to go in? So what this allows you to do, and I can expand on this a little bit more, is that you're able to go and add codes here, right? So if you wanted like homogeneous product lines for comparing apples and apples, you can absolutely do that. Um, so, because sometimes the task or the WBS descriptions aren't consistent, right? 
So we provide the ability to go and add those codes so that if you're trying to get, I think the keyword is homogeneous or apples to apples, essentially, that's a key feature. So when we go and implement somewhere, um, that's a key part it is not just having, you know, the, like I said, the, the tools are a means to an end, but the process is key here. You can also go and add um, independent variables to these things, i.e. technical performance, operational. So you can put in like, what are the power, weight and, and or speed criteria, things of that nature. And then you can go plot that information against the dependent variables, i.e. hours, cost, even quantities. And then you're able to go and, and analyze that data and make a much better backing of the estimate. So the, the key thing here too is when I go and leverage this historical data and, and Chuck made reference to this when we were talking is maybe the reason it's in orange is it's leveraging actuals data. So that's, that's your primary data that you probably want, right? We can also yep. leverage historical estimates, but um, the reason it, this is in orange is you probably want to go after those actuals first. Um, but you have to be careful about that too, right? Because you have to know where it is from a work in process standpoint, how many units you've captured versus you have to kind of know where you're at and what you're looking at. And, and Chuck, maybe you could talk to that when we when we get there. But I mean, that's key is you, you can't just, we could provide ways to do this, but you have to put it in a process so that things are make sense and then train on that. <clears throat> um, at this point, I actually read the um, the recent parametric cost journal that came out, and I thought that was really good, uh, particularly, well, in transparency, the one article I read was by Sondra Burney the, with the BS and the BOEs. And he says that um, the reason for failure to use historical data is, is four points, right? And, and um, I think Chuck, you make reference to this later on in the, in, in the presentation, but um, so number one, no data may be available if the project is like a new project or the OEM is going into a different market. That's number one. Um, the fun and this is most common from what I see is the functional engineer or estimator may take the easy path by set asserting engineering judgment, right? So they're just putting in from a tribal knowledge standpoint, what, what should it take? Or, and this is where you reference something later on, Chuck, is the, the functional estimator may attempt to estimate cost in the WBS at too low of a level when the data was collected at a higher level of the WBS or, or data point. So uh, be careful with that or a combination of these first three cases. But um, I would su suggest or add to that that the estimator asserts engineering judgment primarily because a lot of times the access to the data is just really difficult or then they can't make sense of it, right? And the ability to find that homogeneous data is next to impossible. So really um, it's setting up that process and discipline to the data alignment up front and the collection and availability in a central location to solve this problem. So we can provide the ability, but without a process to go put your proper codes for common work products on there and train the estimators to go look at, oh, if I plot, you know, power versus uh, hours, for example, what, what should I use based on this? Or what is that, what is that data even telling me? So once they're trained on that, they're going to have a much better quality backing of, of your estimate from a rationale standpoint. So uh, my last point here before we get into the next slide is um, the OEMs or government contractors that, that adopt this methodology, this will definitely become a competitive advantage for you with this, with this process-driven mindset. So it's a key is combining, you know, the technology with a, with a process that makes sense for your company. Okay, second um, primarily challenge, Chuck, you wanna cover this one? I'm, I muted myself, I was coughing, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so the, um, you know, basically, you know, I, I, I emphasize that storing proposal data or BOEs in a, a central location is, is, a, is a real plus and something that we're lacking on. And it seems that we end up recreating the wheel uh, many times over. Uh, 
you know, once upon a time did a BOE and, you know, many years ago, and it was, I'm sure it was brilliant because that's what we do is brilliant work. And um, I had an opportunity to use that same type of theory and another proposal. I was able to, to pull that out and use it. I could resurrect that. But if nobody else had seen that, uh, they, would, they wouldn't be able to use that. Uh, golden BOEs and templates are items that we, are, we try to create, um, yet it, it seems to have little traction, you know, because then it comes into where do you store them if you don't have a centralized uh, location. So even though you may have repeatable work and, and efforts that continue on, it doesn't always translate. Uh, in, in my company, we have many contracts and many, many products, um, but I always, I always like the Lockheed Martin where you got an airplane, you know what the product is, you know where, where it is. Uh, the F-16, the F-35, F-22, the landing gear is always WBS 1620. The mid fuselage is always WBS 1230. You know what, the, you know your product and it's always gonna be, a, you have a good database to work from. Um, and so having that, it's, it's a good, good plus. Problem that I found with a standardization or reusing a BOE is that you can run into a situation on a competitive proposal where you're doing a BOE for the Navy and yet you pulled a sample from the Army and you left the Army reference in there and you just don't look, you don't look good. We've also have to size the estimate the BOEs to the size of the scope that's being uh, estimated. So uh, if you end up with a thousand hour estimate and you had takes 40 pages of rationale to support that, I think there's probably an easier way to do that. Or that thousand hours should have just been rolled up into a higher level uh, system engineering type of support. And, and countering that, yeah, I've also come across formats where customers want separate BOEs for each individual CLIN, but you have the same rationale written 10 times over where you could have just answered that in, in one BOE with one table of 10 CLINs and just, and just showing those, those hours. So rational thought seems to escape us in, in the heat of the, uh, the battle a lot of times. Tom? Yeah, so just... I'm curious about that. So just wanted to ask a question there um, as far as the, the, it seems like the tasks you're referring to are repeat tasks that maybe happen once and then are repeatable, but you, you end up breaking those out into separate tasks. Is that, is that somewhat accurate? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you know, you could just basically say, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but you could sit there and say, Hey, I got my, I got a, a program manager for, for multiple clans. So you you write all the history, the say, saying the same thing over and over and over again. And it's just a sharp stick in the eye to the evaluator. I, I've seen the same BOE so many times that you tell me the same task, but it's for 10 different clans. So you put it on 10 different pages. And you could have just said, hey, I got a program manager supporting this for this period of performance. And here are the 10 clans and, and there's your table. It's still a thousand hours instead of 10 pages of a hundred hours each. Work smarter. <laughs> right. And, and I think that point was made in the paper, the BS and the BOEs is where it makes sense. Roll the data up to a higher level, if at all possible, especially when it's repeatable like that. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so let's let's get into the best practice for this and then we'll look at ways to, to handle this. So best practice. Um, so if you don't have a centralized database, it makes it very difficult, right? But if you have a way to establish a sh shareable uh, estimate component library and methodology and way you re do repeatable stuff for fast and accurate estimate building, right? We call this the process library. So there are ways to go and store this central data. <clears throat> and I'll just give you a visual of how we do this. Um, so the, the top part, of the illustration here, think of a base unit, right? And this could be anything. You're building something. In this case, it's a uh, shop replaceable component. Um, it takes a certain level of engineering hours for three different types of engineers. That's that's one unit, right? So now, to Chuck's point, I needed to go do this, you know, 40 times over a thousand hours. Well, why do I got to break this into 
you know, 40 different components when I can just go and essentially use this SRC core unit, right? And then with a combination in my shared location, so I can have my engineers go and access this. This is our, our standard for an SRC. Um, that logic of the BOE should ideally be repeatable. That's how you're gonna get to standardization. Uh, so why not store the attributes in that, in, in that central location um, for that SRC, for example, is one modular component. So the idea here is to build the, you know, the base resource for one unit, and allow for replication. So down here on the bottom part of this, you can see frequency and duration <clears throat> components here that I can go and specify. So in other words, this, this happens over a period of uh, five years and it happens annually. And I'm doing this four times per annum, right? So I can define those parameters that allows me to just very quickly leverage the core unit and multiply that that repeatable methodology over and over. So you don't have to drive the evaluator crazy. And it, it, it will provide that one rolled up table as opposed to blowing it all out. And, and quite frankly, that's just insane amount of work too. I don't know if you can avoid that with, quite frankly, it's it's technology, but it's, it's kind of like just simple logic, right? Can yeah. I establish a way to make frequency and duration repeat this and then rationalize it per that. I'm just repeating the same thing over and over. So this can help avoid the complexity and having to repeat that BOE 50 or 100 times in the work breakdown structure. <clears throat> um, another key point though to this is ideally, you know, there's there's values in this. Don't just, once you establish these these core units, right, for whatever it is, 31 hours, 25 hours, six hours, that's what it takes for one SRC, for example, don't don't just keep that blindly in there. Have some feedback process where I'm able to update this from from what it's taking me on average um, in in the data I'm actually collecting. Um, any comments on that, Chuck? Before we move on, no, nope, I think you covered it. Okay, All right. So here's the third uh, challenge. So, so this was an interesting one. Uh, I, 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 we, we talk about risk assumptions, but there's also the opportunities that the SME uh, may insert into a BOE. Either case can be dangerous. If you have too high of an estimate, if you're, if you're too pessimistic and you, and you have a lot of risk built into there, you're probably going to lose the award. If it's too low, you're going to be executing a red program. Uh, you know, the, the biggest issue that we have, and I, I mentioned this earlier is the transfer of knowledge from the SME to the rest of the estimated community is a really big concern. I think everybody's feeling that today with the onset of the silver tsunami and the retiring baby boomers. So, so there's a lot of knowledge going out the door. So getting that, getting that information is, is a key thing. Um, getting the reviews of the BOEs in process and correcting the methodologies is also a shortcoming. Uh, you have arguments that you don't have time to time to do the reviews or lack of budget. You know, it just doesn't cut it. It has to be done. Uh, you, you have to be providing that supervisory review in proposals. And having a quality product up front brings you, saves you time in the back end and eliminates the rework. So it's, it's just one of those type of things where I think SMEs, know what it takes. They can look at something and say it's going to be a 10,000 hours, but sometimes they don't they don't come up with the right philosophy or 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 methodology to generate that estimate. So you just have to you just have to be smart and you got to look at them and and make sure you have good history to tie that off. So I'll stop there, Tom. So just curious uh, Chuck, um, when when a new estimator comes in, how often is there, um, I guess I'm trying to get an idea of how often is there engineering judgment versus data backing up the estimate, or, or is that is that always visible? Because I know sometimes the functional folks get involved in the estimate, and sometimes the cost engineers may lose sight of what's actually going on. Uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question, Tom. The we, we have a process where we review the 
BOEs and, and the cost volumes before they go out the door to the customer. And oftentimes at that final scrub, I'm reading page after page of engineering judgment and or a complexity factor based off of engineering judgment. And I'm sitting there thinking like, tell me, tell me more. You, you got to give me, you know, a, a junior engineer saying he's got engineering judgment doesn't have, doesn't know what he doesn't know. If I had a senior engineer with 20 years and he's been working on that circuit card design, I might buy into that, but please, you got to give me something more than it's a 50% complexity. Tell me it's 50% of the components or it's a single-sided card versus a double-sided card. Give, give the evaluator something to, they could sink their teeth into. It's like, okay, I get that. Could still be wrong, but at least at least you at least you put you know some goal posts there that you can you know you're in between and say like, and, and otherwise it's 50 percent it's unsupported don't know don't believe it why isn't it 10 percent right yeah I, I think one of the keys is just being able to measure what you put out there and get some get some feedback you know even with um subject matter expert expert judgment you know we're a software company and i i know that there are guys that come or gals that come pretty close to what their estimates are and others don't and probably the ones that are that don't come close are the better developers yeah because uh, they're focused more on their work than they don't really care what the estimate is right so you have to I, I think sometimes know who you're working with and how much do you even trust that engineering judgment but but you're right though having some sort of goalpost to, to base it on is is uh key so I'll just go over a couple of best practices here. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think establishing a process to capture that data and make it fine and easy to reuse is, is key. Training on the process so nothing is, is assumed. Um, so, again, if estimators are given a central location for the data um, in a way that's proven process, then, then your, the quality of your estimates has just increased drastically. Um, sometimes, like um, to the BS and BOE's document, you're going after a new market or there's a new product you really don't know. You've never done this before. Um, I was a program manager in a past life, and I know even on like development stuff, there's there's repeatable tasks that you do in development, even if it's a new product that that may not um, correlate 100 percent, but there are some repeatable things. But I, I understand there's absolutely new territory. Um, in those cases, oftentimes what we might recommend is a three-point estimate as opposed to just one, one point. That way you have, you know, best case, worst case, most likely, and you can ask a little more questions because it's, it's really the first time. This would be maybe for the first time you're getting an estimate. You have no historical. Right. Um, and, and again, a feedback loop. So being able to reference and leverage not just historical data, but ideally, you know, current performance data. So again, looking at the homogeneous part of it, right? Is it the same product or is it close enough to the same product that I can use it? And am I able to normalize that data in some way if that normalization is applicable? And then ultimately, if I'm using that repeatable piece, I can take that data and update that process library component for that reasonable data. So. Ultimately, what you're trying to do here is is take the um, personality out of the equation or really that, not really a personality, but, you know, you can probably think of three estimators or three um, functional uh, estimators in your organization and, and say they're either going to be high, low, or in the middle, right, based on what you know about them. Um, so think about that. And, and, you know, that's okay. That's all how they think about it. But if you're able to back that data up in some way, shape or form, particularly with primary data, that's, that's the way to go. Um, and Chuck mentioned this too, include peer review capability. Um, sometimes there's argument that we don't have enough time, but I think, um, you know, the ones that do this are going to be definitely a step ahead. And also, if you have the documentation and you're able to pull that up quickly, um, you know, you're, you're standardizing on your BOE because you're reusing some rationale or making, maybe tweaking it a bit. But sometimes um, things don't change that much for repeatable work products. So definitely think about leveraging that to, to the best of your uh, ability.
All right, so let's move on to the um, the fourth challenge. Yeah, so so changes and changes never happen in proposals from from what I've seen, but um, it's the last minute changes that really really just uh, destroyed us. Um, they, you know, going back many years before we had fancy pro pricer type of pricing programs type of sort of things, I had to spend one night. <laughs> Uh, reducing a four billion dollar proposal down to three billion with supportable BOEs and and load it into our our pricing system at that time and have it ready for a Saturday morning review uh, and that was it was it was not a pleasant task because you, you start looking at it it's like well what what did I change how did I get there and how did you make all that happen uh, that that's an extreme that's an extreme example, but in a, in our regular day day to day process, going through it today, uh, I, I have staff that are walking into reviews, and and at the last minute, somebody says, "Oh, we're going to change the design from a, uh, you know, four you know four aperture to two aperture type of thing." It's like, well, that's kind of late in the game to to make that change because I don't have any material costs, I don't have anything like that. Oh, and it's due tomorrow. So you're trying to make so some type of changes and, and swinging on that. So it's easy to go into a pricing system and just hit the multipliers and and the um, uh, dial it up to say, hey, uh, ex extend the period of performance and, and the level of efforts. But it's it's really too hard to get back and tie that back into the BOEs is what I find, and that's where you end up having your BOEs then become disconnected from your price and. It, it then causes the evaluator issues because you, you said here it's a thousand hours, but in your pricing you you have two thousand hours. Oh, that's because we doubled the quantities. Well, it'd be nice if you told somebody and and, and track that. So that's 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 keeping track of everything is a really tough tough type of thing. And and uh, you know also for for negotiations, being able to to quickly pivot at the table and provide. Uh, what those changes are. I mean, oftentimes I'll get a negotiated settlement and they say, oh, here's the number, go make it, go make it hit. It, it'd be nice if I was there to at least know which WBS I need to change. Tom? Right. So in essence, um, it sounds like maybe the estimating system or the BOE system is a little disconnected from the pricing system or, or those, those two are kind of in, somewhat independent, right? Yeah, some, somewhat independent because you're working two different sides of it. Uh, you, you you get you get program direction that says, "Hey, we got to move this quickly." Um, and there's, and I'm sure everybody on on the call here has had their experiences. And you think back where uh, everybody said, "Oh, this is this has got to be the design," and they go forward with that, and then they end up going from a four channel to a two channel solution. Great, that's that's wonderful. All right, one of one of the most brilliant moves. I've ever seen, and I won't mention the names of the program, was they were going into first flight, uh, on the, on, getting ready to go into first flight, and they said, hey, we, this design is wrong. So they scrapped the design and, and ended up being late to the game, yet still won the program because that was a bold move to make that change. Didn't make my life any easier trying to come up with the estimate for that design change, but um, sometimes, right. sometimes that's what you got to do. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I did experience something similar in a lifelong time ago at DRS. I was the program manager and we went from an air-cooled to a water-cooled system. Uh, it's fun trying to get that estimate out in any stretch of the imagination, but we did end up winning too because it was just a better design. But boy, it didn't just cause um, estimating changes, right, and all the headaches that that took, but it was also engineering and the spacing of all the components had to change based on, on you know, heat removal and stuff like that. So that was a high, high-stress situation, but we didn't end up winning the proposal. Um, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. So uh, so the point is to to make life easier, right, when, when you get those rapid changes in the 11th hour negotiations, how can I make that on the BUE side a little easier you know i look at pricing as just a downstream mechanism you, you get your inputs your source hours your parts your quantities and all that the the price is just dri driven from rates and overheads and escalation right. right 
So the key really is the source data, the, the BOE is the source input, what's it going to take, hours, quantities, and then the rationale to that. Ideally, you're implementing a platform that has the ability to por perform that what-if modeling through technology, right? So create a procedure to capture and report those changes to the estimate. So in other words, I can take a snapshot of the cost estimate, make those changes to go from air cooled to water cooled, or you know some of those design changes. <clears throat> And now I'm able to tell you what version one, version two is without having to go sift back through Excel, see what the changes were, compare two different versions, update manually the BOE. Because in a lot of cases, you can, you can drive the BOE rationale if it's an automated um, way of coming up with the estimate. In other words, you get, you're doing this five times, five times five tests per year or whatever. Some of that, a lot of that is direct input, which becomes part of the BOE rationale. And if it's tied together, um, you're that much further ahead when you have those last minute changes. Um, so uh, we are in a day and age where technology should dictate a level of automation to improve this. And it doesn't really take your job away as an estimator, right? It's gonna give you more time to look at the less arduous stuff and really be able to analyze the estimate better and spend your time on that as opposed to going and chasing all that data through and make sure it all ticks and ties. All right, I think we got, I think we're running good on time here. So our, our, last, uh, our last challenge. Yeah, so uh, methods used by authors uh, tend to uh, vary greatly. Uh, I oftentimes, you know, particularly you end up using a new hire or, or inexperienced estimators that do not fully understand the process or the format for a compliant BOE. Every company has their formats that they use, but you got to train. You got to train them. Um, so once you have them trained in the methods, you know, and, and we do that training here in house, uh, we get them ready to write, but they still don't have all the data they require. And, and some of that issue is if they're being split on on the leadership of proposals, and 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 having to do their day job. So what, what, that, what that means is a lot of times we don't, uh, and I guess it depends on how your company is set up. Uh, we've had some, I've had some experiences where we have engineering estimator groups that that's what they do, that's their job, that is their day job. But more often than not, I'm finding that, you know, they gotta do their design work and get the product out the door and then, oh, here's another proposal that you need to go work on and write some BOEs, and they don't want to deal with it and, and, and take that time to, to do the work. So it's, uh, it's just a matter of getting people up to speed and, 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 and training them in, in how to write a good rationale. Okay. So, yeah. So the best practice is really um, to standardize and train on that rationale or BOE writing process, right? So if you can, if you could put stuff in the same boxes every time or the same attributes and even provide a good starting point in, in a system and then train on that system with work instructions. So you're not changing your process, you're just fitting a tool to help you with your process, right? So you're identifying, capturing and storing that information in a central location. So a lot of times people think of the term data warehouse, but think of a concept where all the estimates and the rationale are stored in one database. And I'm not talking about Excel and Word, but everything's common and one can be driven from the other in, in a lot of cases. Sometimes if there's a, a engineering judgment and you're just coming up with hours and there's no drivers, then yeah, you might not, you have to be careful with that. But there are a lot of other pieces where you can tie the rationale to the estimate itself and one can drive the other. And then those two things are tied together if you have the right technology in that relationship. So the point is, um, you know, technology has come a long way. It's time to stop thinking linearly about, you know, as far as like scattered Word and Excel documents with the hope of being, you know, that 80 hour per week proposal hero. And I know Chuck, you mentioned that you aren't in that situation anymore, but that, that's no. some of what goes on with the heavy lifting of that data all over the place. But getting in a central centralized database 
you can establish things like this where your source data, all your WBS attributes are there, your task attributes, um, you know, you're coming up with the methodologies, the justification. If you update one, the justification could potentially be updated, particularly if you're looking at like that process library concept. You know, if you change the core data drivers, you can potentially update the core rationale to that and just have more of a standard common way of doing things as opposed to just, um, you know, wide open Excel, because you can do anything Excel and Word. Uh, but if you standardize your process, think of that first and then have an automated way to do that to, to kind of standardize on the type and the font and how this is spaced and everything. And not only that, but have the data tied together so that it all makes sense and you're not constantly chasing yourself through oh is this right we we had that last minute change is that rationale still right or does everything tie out to pricing you don't necessarily have to do that anymore um so with that i think oh i think i have one more slide really quick and i'll just go through this really fast megan so we can get to the q a um so just a Reiterate, Prodstream, we consider ourselves an end-to-end -end software solution, not just cost estimating, but also project management. And that's really the way we're able to capture um, some of that actual historical data and reference that and tag attributes to it. So you can plot that data and reuse it from even doing some of your own parametrics. Um, so as you saw, the key is to be able to make that data accessible and find it within seconds and reuse that data right in your estimate. So the whole idea is you're more highly profitable because you're getting that feedback mechanism of what the cost should be, making you more competitive and ideally um, you know, generating more wins. So Prodstream database can uh, store all that data and make it queryable so you're getting rapid answers and reusability, particularly in that 11th hour, you know, when you're, you're going through those changes and, and negotiations. Okay, and with that, I'd um, like to open up the floor for questions. Outstanding. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Chuck. We, everyone who is on the line, if you'd like to send us a question or have your question answered, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, I'll start with one of the ones we got during the session. Um, can you explain how the change capture works? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, there, there's a couple different layers of changes, right? So one, you can turn on an automated way to track those changes, which is really just a transactional audit log. So if you turn that on from inception of the program, you're able to see every single transaction of, you know, Joe Smith added 40 hours at this point and then took 20 away. And that's just a very transactional thing. The, the cool thing about that is you can find the needle in the haystack and find out who did what, particularly if you're trying to chase something down. That's the first layer, right? So the second layer is I need to make a change like Chuck was talking about. I'm making some sort of design change. What I could do is I could snapshot that data right at the point before I make that. And then that just becomes your live data. I would then go make that change. So now I have that that history uh, of that database in the background and I can compare version one to version two, for example, on all the attributes, not just um, the estimate and the pricing, but pretty much everything that's in, in the database. So I can see my traceability automatically, but that's a little process driven, right? Because I got to know that, oh, at this point I am making that design change. So there has to be some um, processing control around that to say, okay, we're through workflow, for example, we're going to go and um, make that change at this point and compare back uh, one versus the other. So I, I, hopefully that covers that covers it. Okay. Can Prodstream directly connect to SAP or other MRP systems and pull historical data? So yeah, we have in the past connected to to. SAP and other MRP systems typically. So we have an API where we can go out and reach out and shake hands that way, or, or we have done direct connection as well. I will say that almost every implementation of SAP and, and or MRP systems, we've worked with a lot of them, right? And, and um, almost everybody's different if you're using the same platform. 
because process is key. So you might be pulling data a little differently or your process might be a little bit different, but you know, the first level is mapping out the data, tables to tables, and then what is the intermediate? Like, is there um, any kind of human interaction of transferring that data, those types of things. But yes, we have um, had experiences where we've moved data ultimately both directions in, in some cases, right? Between between those systems. So move, moving MRP type data, particularly for materials, because we're a very uh, material intensive, capable quantities type system. Um, that is often part of the implementation. So yes. Okay. Uh, the there was a question in the chat asking where one can read that BS and BOE's article that is in the ICA Journal of Cost Analysis and Parametrics. You can download that from the ICA website. You can go to the tab on the top menu that says publications, and there's also an image on the rotating front banner. Um, so you can get to it there. New question, will ProdStream hold RFQ for material and subs to the BOE? I'm sorry, Megan, can you repeat that? Can, does Prod, will ProdStream hold RFQ for? Material you, and subs to the BOE. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have areas where we can store um, quotes, RFQ information directly to um, the suppliers, right? So you can you can set up your your components or your subcontractors or you're going out to get quotes, whatnot. You can store all that data directly in in your um, your supply um, side of the estimates. All right, can do you have any ROI case studies, and can you give an ROI range? Yeah, so if you're interested in an ROI case study, we have particular examples that we can give out, and they're you know they're they're from real customers. Um, but yeah, typically what we see is anywhere between a, a two month and an eight month uh, payback period, and sometimes you know up to 300 four hundred percent ROI on combination of the application and um, consulting. So pretty usually pretty quick um, return on investment and I will just add too that that those aren't our numbers that's that's something we do as a service as part of the um, procurement process is helping with a business case that ROI study um, so we we run the workshop and based on on some um, interaction with the company and them seeing the efficiencies and or maybe even the possibility for increased increased P win those are based on um, real, real numbers from um, customers that we work with th through part of that ROI workshop. So this is the last question I've gotten on the chat. Everybody listening, I think we may have time for one more. So if you weren't sure, uh, now's your chance. But this question is, is the program designed to allow contracts, purchasing, estimating, and PM to submit data into solicitation? I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. Chuck, do you have an idea? <laughs> what when they say submit into solicitation? I, I think they're they're suggesting that if they went out to um, get quotes from suppliers, or um, or say like Lockheed Martin was to reach out and get get an estimate from us, is the way I interpret that. I could be wrong. Hard to tell. Yeah, so if I interpret it that way, that's that's a good thought is you can absolutely give access into that so they can go and enter their own data through through the web uh, tool. Or you can go out for, um, you know, particular export certain data so that they could fill it out and return it back. But certainly the easiest way because you have security. If you go out through Workbench and allow them to enter those those estimates directly is certainly one way that we've dealt with primary to sub um, situations. It just really ultimately depends on sometimes security and then sometimes on, on the level of comfort that you're giving a, a sub access into your system, but we, can, um, we can't separate that off. So they're only seeing through workflow what they have um, 
provided to them as far as you know subcontractor quotes we've unmuted our Chuck, listener to clarify oh, go ahead hey chuck and tom uh wayne cummins here uh, yeah that was my question and for clarification i was referring to it like the way our company is developed uh and multiple companies i've worked with in previously that um you have your estimating department you might have purchasing planning you might have uh, pms other departments all putting in data that right. can so like the purchasing department can put in rfqs uh and rfps contracts has subs and their quotes and they can they're collectively adding the data that will virtually build the boe so could it is this set up where the multiple people can work simultaneously or is this kind of a one collective central data location and one group or person is submitting the data yeah so good question i'm, I'm glad you clarified that because i didn't understand it that way but yeah it's absolutely meant to be an enterprise wide um to where you know many can operate and, and input data simultaneously and there is workflow associated with it so you can go out and ping that procurement person or estimator or um, subcontracts manager to go out and, and input that data in the requisite area. But there is no, um, th there is a little bit of process control and that you can lock an area of an estimate if you don't want, if you want to work in, in like say a WBS or task exclusively, you can do that. But certainly um, as many people as you want, in fact, we have it to where sometimes where there's upwards of you know, a thousand functional estimators working that, that can input the data at the same time. That, you know, that doesn't often happen. It might be just not all those estimators are working year round so that you might be 10, 20%, but still it's a lot of people and different um, functional departments hitting the application at one time. So it is meant to be an enterprise application. Well, I think, uh, I think you've wowed them guys because uh, we are out of questions and with three minutes left to go on the hour, I think that would give everybody a moment to get their brains back together before they go into their next meeting. Um, uh, Megan, just, just real quick, I want to mention uh, potential next steps is, you know, we have the ICO workshop coming up, as I'm sure you know, on May 16th through 18th in San, San Antonio. So if any of this caught your eye, please stop by our booth and receive the top 10 challenges and best practices for cost estimation teams to expand on what we talked about today. And then if you've liked what we talked about, you know, if you if you want to engage with prods treatment in a meaning, meaningful way, we do have a couple of quick ways to onboard. Um, you know, we're not just a software company to engage in a meaningful way. We have a, a process assessment or even a 60 day quick start program to provide um, you know, quick time to value. So it's not just go buy the application. It's how do you process and, and we can get engaged that way. So if you're interested, there's my contact information at the bottom. And I wanted to thank uh, Chuck Kurtz from BAE for joining us. And um, you're welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. All right, and thank you, Tom. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. Looking forward to seeing as many of you as I as we can at the workshop in San Antonio. I know I see a bunch of names that I we've printed out badges for. Uh, to, by lunchtime tomorrow, we should have the slides and the recording from today's presentation up on the ICO website under uh, webinars and tech showcase webinars. Basically, the same place where you found the sign up information. Um, so thanks again, Chuck. Thanks again, Tom. Any final words? Nope. Thanks, everyone. Hope thanks, to see everyone. you in San Antonio. Yes, indeed. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Thanks.